So uh, welcome to this iMoot session um, at iMoot 16. Uh, we've got Joshua Bragg, who's going to help us to prevent multiple choice from sucking, which is something which will amaze my students, I'm sure. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. He's always a good speaker, and I'm sure that we're going to get a lot from it. So over to you, Joshua. Thanks, Andy. Um... As I was saying before, if y'all got a chance to pull up a, a a Moodle quiz that you can look at the statistics on while we do this, um, that'd be great. But um, and at the end of the day, multiple choice is one of those things that it's it's really hard to do well. Um, there's a lot of a lot of places where multiple choice gets a really bad rap, and I think mostly because it's so hard to do well that a lot of the examples that we see of multiple choice are really just not very good. Um, I mean, you get questions like this, um, which at first glance don't seem to be too bad. And then you start really kind of looking at it and saying, well, C is pretty obviously the answer they want you to pick, right? It's the longest one of the bunch. Um, and then D is just crazy. Um, so it's clearly nobody's supposed to pick that when they're trying to make it easy on you. Um, but this is not the this is not the right way to do multiple choice. And yet that's what we see so very often in um, lots of different places. And so the the real solution I think to this is to look very closely at the statistics in Moodle. Moodle actually has a pretty large chunk of statistics that will run on quiz on quizzes and and you can make sure that the using those statistics that everything is looking the way that it's supposed to be. So what I'm going to show you is is kind of a case study from some questions that I use in my class. So I've pulled the uh, entire released North Carolina final chemistry exam uh, from a few years ago into Moodle. And I've got it set up right now as a, as a practice test in my course. Uh, so students can actually take it uh, several different times if they want to. And we're in the middle of exam review right now. Um, and this is really kind of fundamentally a good example so that you can see what the statistics are supposed to look like. They spent a lot of time designing these questions and making sure that they were good. And so um, other than one question in there that I wanted to show you as, an, as a bad example, um, this is a um, this is kind of fundamentally a good example so that you can see what it's supposed to look like um, so that then you can uh, compare those sorts of things later when you see them. So this is just kind of your standard uh, standard four question multiple choice test. There's a lot of um, pr problems to work out. Um, this being a chemistry exam, um, and so this is for a this is for a high school class um, to do. So the the place where you go to get these statistics is in the actual quiz settings themselves in the quiz session itself. Um, most people just go over into the administration, click on the results, or click on the link to the results uh, in the main body of things. But if you click on the little uh, triangle here, then you'll get a drop down of things that you can select. And so there's this statistics report here along the way. Um, and that gives you a whole big gigantic pile of, of things that you can do. The, this is the first section of that report, which shows you a huge number of statistics here. Um, so when I pulled these, uh, when I pulled these screenshots, there were 30 students who had taken it w at least once and then a few more had taken it several more times. Um, and so you can see the, the average grade for the first attempt and, and several of the other attempts as well. Um, and so you'll also notice here that they've got a, a median grade. And so just a, just a quick show of hands, cause I'm not sure how, um, how well you guys are familiar with uh, statistics in the first place. Um, how, how comfortable are you guys with the idea of a average versus a median and what the difference is between the two? So if you, um, if you look over on the left-hand side of, of the, um, in the user's menu, you'll see the little hand icon. Uh, you can actually, there's a little raise your hand button. You can also pick a, um, an emoji if you'd like to um, tell me what you think about it. But if you're, let me know whether you're comfortable um, with um, the mean versus the median versus the average and what, what does that, uh, what does that all mean? Um, yeah, Andy, I, I think the median is, is more useful too when we're talking about, um, when we're talking about uh, test scores particularly. Um, and so tell you what, I'll, I'll walk through that just to make sure that kind of everybody's on the 
on the same page here. Um, the so the average is it, the average and the mean are the same thing. Um, that's what we normally talk about. That's how we normally do a, an average. You add all of the scores up and you divide by the number of scores that you have. So in this case, we're going to take all 30 scores and then add them up and divide by 30. Um, the problem with that is that very low scores or very high scores could skew that average. So that's actually fairly common for tests. Um, you have a lot of a lot of times people set up tests so that the grades are kind of clustered up towards the top, which means there's a very big range down at the bottom where if you got students that score in that range, they can essentially pull the average down. So a median is done differently. It's still sort of the same idea. It's still still kind of telling you where the middle of the um, where the middle of the data is, but it's doing it in a slightly different way. What you do for the median is you list all of the grades in order from the highest to the lowest, and then you find the middle of the list, and the middle of the list is the median score. So the way that you interpret the median is that half of the students scored above 74% in this case, the other half of the students scored below a 74. And so that's always going to work out to be true. And so you can see from the uh, difference between the median grade versus the average grade, you can see that there are some of those low scores that are dragging down the average. Um, and so it's actually not very, not a very large change there, but it is a it is a small drop off in this one. For most non-standardized tests, and and so this is really a standardized test that I kind of copied in into Moodle. Um, for most non-standardized tests, there's usually a fairly big difference between the, the mean grade, the average grade, and the median grade um, because of those lower scores trying to essentially dragging things down. Um, the next piece, the next number here that's uh, important is the, the standard deviation. Um, so standard deviation is a measure of how much spread there is in the scores. So if you think about a bell curve, um, people are kind of familiar with the um, the idea of a, of a certain part of the bell curve being um, a certain amount of percentage of the people. That actually, the way that that's done, talked about is in terms of the standard deviation. So if you're one standard deviation away from the average in uh, on a bell curve, then that encloses 63% of all of the students taking that. So what the standard deviation is telling you is that 63% of all the students who took this quiz are 22% away from the 71 average. So 22% on either side. So that would mean that 63% of the scores are between a 93 and a 40, 49. And so that's a pretty big spread. For most normal tests, they're not standardized tests at their heart. Um, the standard deviation is typically a lot lower than that, typically around 12% or so. 15% um, is, is pretty typical on some of my tests that I give in class. Um, but standard deviation of 22% is actually pretty large, and that's actually a function of the fact that this is a, a standardized test. When you have a standardized test, you're looking to essentially spread out the students as much as you can so that you can tell them apart better from each other. Um, that doesn't necessarily give you pretty grades to work with, um, so most people don't make that sort of test when they're trying to give a student a grade. Um, but for a standardized test uh, that you're going to curve later anyway, then that's a that's a good good place to be kind of sitting is to spread them out as much as you can. The kind of the most important statistics here along the way are these numbers down here at the bottom. The uh, coefficient of internal consistency, the error ratio, and the standard error. So um, uh, being a high school teacher, I'm I'm kind of dependent on um, comments and and other things along the way. So if you guys are have any questions, um, I I'm really kind of uh, handicapped by not seeing you guys. Um, you spend a, n as much time teaching high school as I have, then it's um, you, you come to rely on the looks on people's faces. So if I'm if I'm confusing you at all, if there's anything that I'm saying that's that's losing you, please just let me know. Um, Feel free to comment up a storm in the chat. Um, it it makes me makes me feel like I'm talking to someone out there. Um, so anyway, if we um, if we look at the 
um, the first number up there is the in coefficient of internal consistency. And so that's, um, if you're familiar with statistics at all, that's Cronbach's alpha. Um, the the, what, the co coefficient of internal consistency tells you how well the test is measuring the same sorts of things. Essentially, how well do the question scores correlate with the overall score at the end? So when I'm writing a chemistry test, I want the chemistry test to be a test of chemistry. I don't want it to be a test of calculus. Um, that's not what I'm looking for. And even a test that is testing both chemistry and calculus is not really going to be a good, useful test for me. Um, I need just to make sure that the questions that I'm asking are measuring the student's abilities in chemistry. And so that's what this coefficient of internal consistency is telling you is how well all of the questions in the test are getting at the same sort of construct in terms of what you're trying to measure. So seeing a coefficient of internal consistency, anything above 90% is excellent. That's the sort of thing that you really only ever see in standardized tests. Most normal tests that people will look at will be somewhere in the neighborhood of 70% uh, coefficient of internal consistency. That's pretty good. That's good enough. Um, when you start getting low in that coefficient of internal consistency, that's when you start having problems. And so if you see something that is in the neighborhood of 50% on that coefficient of internal consistency, that really means that you need to start taking a look at some of the questions on that test and making sure that you're, they're really still good and mean what they are supposed to do. Um, so really, this is kind of getting at how reliable the test is that you're working with. The next bit there, the error ratio, is really tied to the internal consistency. The error ratio is the percent of the standard deviation that is due to random effects that we don't um, have any way of, of determining what they are versus the student's ability. So the way this error ratio is, um, is essentially determined is you're comparing the scores of each of the questions in the test to and how well each student does on those to the overall score at the end. We want student scores to be dependent on, in my case, how much chemistry they know. Um, and so the the idea here is that the um, this error ratio is telling you how much that depends on how much chemistry they know as opposed to the other effects that are going on with testing. Um, just the way the questions are written, any other any other pieces along the way. And so if we go back to um, the standard deviation that we saw before, the standard deviation was 22%. And so the error ratio here is 28%. And that's so 28% of 22. Um, is the is the percent that is not accounted for in how well the student is doing. Um, Dave, I don't think that the random guess score is accounted for in that error in in that error ratio um, because for each individual, well, actually, that's a good question. I don't know. I need to look at that. Um, that's not the, this is not the same thing as the, it's not the same thing as the standard, as the random guess score, um, because the ran, and the ran, and the random guess score in this case would be 25%, but it's not going to be the same sort of thing. That error ratio is for a lot of multiple choice tests, even higher than this, um, because it's not so much a function of students guessing as it is a, a function of, um, kind of effects of the questions themselves and how they're designed. <laughs> yeah, Andy. Well, the interesting thing about um, the interesting thing about uh, well done multiple choice is that it is you're actually going to get a better score on a multiple choice test if you guess than if you know just a very very small amount about the thing that's being tested and the multiple choice are well designed. Um, so it's actually really hard to tell um, unless you know that the person wasn't guessing on the bottom end. It's if somebody is really trying on the bottom end, but they don't know very much, they can consistently make scores that are below the random guess score if the multiple choice questions are well designed. 
Yeah, well, Kim, that's the the idea here is that the you're trying to distinguish students who know um, who know a lot versus who know a little and all of the points in between. And so you've got to be very careful to design those um, the distractors to get the um, to make sure that they're actually going to essentially fool the students who only know a very small amount about the material. Um, so going back to the the standard error here, the standard error again relates to all of this again and so this is based on how much of those random effects there are versus um, versus error their error ratio and all of this other stuff how much if a student takes this test again how much could their grade change just purely based on the chance pieces that happen during testing based on quiz structure based on uh, where the item choices are um, that sort of thing how much could their grade change so just to give you an example of where this number would become important um, a few years ago uh, the state of north carolina was using um, uh, the standardized finals and some people, certain students had to pass certain finals in order to be able to, uh, in order to be able to graduate essentially. Uh, the standard error for all of those tests was calculated and if a student was within one standard error away from passing, then they were considered to be passing because if that student took it again, they could conceivably score within that range and that would be a normal expected thing. Uh, so in this case we're saying that a student's grade, a real representation of their knowledge could be anywhere within a range of six percent on either side. Um, and that's actually pretty good for most tests. When you're when you're looking at a coefficient of internal consistency um, above 90 percent that that's pretty that's pretty excellent. Um, most tests are are much lower than that. Um, somebody in the first session uh, pulled up some numbers from theirs and they were running close to an 11% standard error, uh, which an 11% standard error means essentially a letter grade for me on either side is the real representation, which really at that point doesn't tell you a lot. Um, this is just uh, a half a letter grade, uh, which is at least a little bit more, uh, a little bit more reasonable. So the, the place where the you really get to figuring out how to make this test as a whole better, how to get that coefficient of internal consistency up, is to start looking at the individual items. And so this is the table that you see next underneath the, um, the overall summary statistics. And this is every single question that's in there. And so um, I just now remembered, Kim, you asked a question earlier about random questions um, and how this, how that all applies in with the random questions. When you look at this pay, this part of the page here, what you'll see is the position for each random question and then depending on how you set up your random questions, the random questions listed underneath it with all of the statistics on those individual questions. Now I say depending on how you set that up because if you set them to pull up only out of one category, then it will display all those questions there and you can see all the stats on them. If you've selected it to pull out of multiple different categories, like say a category and all its subcategories uh, with the random questions, then it will not display all of them as an option. It will just display the highest, uh, the essentially the easiest question out of the bunch, the hardest question out of the bunch, and one somewhere in the middle. And so yeah, Kim, you just have to kind of drag on down and, and start looking at each of the individual options. Now what that does let you do when it shows you all of those individual questions is you can then see when one of those questions is a problem. Because you can see, oh, this one that I'm thinking is about the same level as all these other ones. This one is significantly harder than this other one, or this one is significantly easier. And so you can start to spot the differences between those random questions if you're paying attention to those statistics. So I'm going to pull up just one line of the of the page that I just showed you before, just to kind of talk about some really particular uh, statistics that you need to pay attention to when you're looking at this. Uh, so the first one is this column right here. This is the facility index. And so the facility index under a lot of circumstances is really just the percent of students that got it correct. Um, I say under a lot of circumstances because 
there it will account for partial credit well it will account for certainty based marking questions uh, as well too and so it, it is mostly a percent correct but it is not necessarily always going to be a percent correct so that's an easy way to look and make sure that Again, those random questions are all about the same level of difficulty as you were expecting. Or in this particular case here, looking at this one, 87% uh, of students got it right. I think I can uh, safely say that everybody in the class can handle that one along the way. The more important numbers are these two numbers here on the end, the discrimination index and the discrimination efficiency. Uh, the discrimination index is how well does this student score on this question correlate with their total score on the entire assessment. So what we want is for all of the questions that we put on a test to be predictive of how they're going, how a student is going to do on the entire test. We certainly don't want our best students to be more likely to miss a question than our worst students are. That would not be measuring how well a student knows the material. And so these discrimination indexes essentially run between 100% uh, and negative 100%. And so the uh, bigger is better. The uh, positive number is essentially a requirement for it to be any sort of a good question. Um, if it is, if it were at zero percent, that would essentially be saying that this question can't tell any difference between your best students and your worst students. And so it's essentially none better than the people just guessing on that particular question. So the problem with the discrimination index as a number is that it is really pretty heavily dependent upon how easy or difficult a question is. So there's reasons to put very easy questions on a test, and there's reasons to put very difficult questions on a test. A very easy question will help you distinguish students at the bottom end from the top end. So a very easy question, pretty much everybody in the, say, top three quarters of the class will get it right, and it's the bottom quarter that may be getting those questions wrong. A very hard question is going to do exactly the reverse. Very, very few people are going to get that right, and maybe only the top quarter have a chance of getting it right, or even the top 10 or 5% have a chance of getting that right. Those are still valuable questions because they help you distinguish between the students kind of at all the ends of the spectrum. But it is going to affect how high the discrimination index can go. And so if you look at this particular question here, this question is 87% of students are getting it right. There's not going to be a whole lot of chance for this discrimination index to get terribly high. Because most students are getting it right. And so it's really only distinguishing between the, you know, the top, essentially, 90% uh, of the class from the bottom 10% of the class. So this is where the discrimination efficiency comes in. The discrimination efficiency is basically the same sort of thing as the discrimination index, only it's considering how hard a question is at the same time. And so you'll notice that the discrimination efficiency for this question is much higher than the dis discrimination index because it's saying, well, it, you know, 87% of students are getting this right we're going to kind of factor that out when we're looking at this so that we can see how well this question discriminates based on how hard it is in the first place. So is every, do those terms kind of make sense to everybody? Does everybody see what the, the meaning of those, those terms are? All right, good. I, the, glad that glad that I'm being glad that I'm being clear. It's always a it's always dangerous to start talking statistics to people that you can't even see their faces for. Yeah, so Andy, there definitely are, and so the um, the math of, of this is actually all in a um, is actually all in a um, Moodle Docs web page. Um, and let me see if I can. If I can find that, here it is right here. So math to your heart's content right there. Um, 
And so if you want to see exactly how these numbers are calculated, and all of this comes out of uh, what's known as item response theory, um, which basically says that, um, <laughs> Kim, you're, you're cracking me up. It's okay. Don't, don't feel bad. It's all a matter, math is all just a matter of practice. Um, that's the thing that, that, um, that matters at the end of the day. It's all just a, a matter of, of getting practiced and getting comfortable with it. People talk about how they can't do, um, they can't do the math. Um, and really it's, it's just like anything else. It's just, I mean, it's just like chemistry too. Um, it's a matter of practice and doing the things that you need to do to get better at it. Nobody is necessarily good at anything. It's a matter of how well you practice and make sure you get things done. Um, so anyway, here's a, here's an example of a, of a question that has a fairly low discrimination index. When you look through the list of questions, when you've got a question that has a low discrimination index, it will show up in red like this. And so you can see the discrimination index on this one is, is 4%, 5%. Um, and that, that's fairly awful. Um, it should be really much, much higher than that. Um, for this to be meaningful. So again, what this is saying here is that this question doesn't tell the difference between my best students and my worst students. This question really has no relationship between this score, the student score on this question versus their score on the overall assessment. And so the question is always at this point, well, what's the reason for that? Because there's always a reason why this question isn't doing what we want it to do. Um, and so if you, uh, this question name here is a link. Um, and so if you click on that, then it will give you a list of the answer choices along with how many students picked which ones. And um, you can start to kind of look at the question and see what exactly is going on with this. Now, when I look at this question, uh, so and so we're going we're going into chemistry here, and so you'll just kind of have to take my word for it for uh, for most of you on this. But this is something that um, it, we can make up questions, but it's a lot easier to talk about things that you are actually meaningful. Um, so when I look at this question, there's nothing wrong with this question. These answer choices are all exactly what they should be. Um, this lead dioxide here is exactly the one that I would expect to be the most commonly chosen wrong answer. Right after that is this lead two oxide, which again is another one um, that's likely. Uh, lead oxide is another completely reasonable uh, answer choice here. Um, so then the question becomes, well, why 60% of students are getting this right? Naming compounds is one of those things that at the end of a semester, my students do very well. So why is this question not predicting how well they're going to do on the, on the final exam? And, and really, honestly, why are only 60% of my students getting this question right? And so as I was looking at this, the, I, started, uh, I started looking through to see essentially which students missed this question. And as I was looking through the responses to see which students missed the question and, and, and why they missed it, I started noticing that when students miss this question, probably 80% of the time, lead dioxide or lead two oxide, those two most commonly chosen wrong answers, were listed before lead four oxide in the order of the answer choices. So it turns out that the order of your answer choices really does matter. It matters quite a bit because students don't necessarily read through all of the answer choices before they pick their answer. And so in this case, lead dioxide is, is the primary offender because that looks like, oh yeah, lead dioxide, that's, that's the right answer. Click, move on. Um, when I looked at the ones where students got it right, it was much more likely that lead four oxide was one of the earlier listed choices than in the ones where it got listed wrong. Of the of the 10 people that missed this question, I think only two of them had lead four oxide listed above the wrong answer choice that they chose. So this is the sort of random effect that we're talking about when we talk about um, 
the error ratio and the, the standard error in things. Um, these are things that are not really um, designed into a test, but they do affect things. And so when you look at shuffling answer choices, you have to realize that it does make a difference in where things are. It is not a, it's not necessarily a difference that's testing the chemistry in this case, um, but it is a useful, uh, it is a, it is an important thing to pay attention to. This is the reason why uh, when you look at uh, standard advice, advice about how to write multiple choice questions or how to take multiple choice tests, there's a, usually a comment in there about A being the least likely choice to pick because most people when they write a multiple choice question don't want to put the correct answer first because the thought is that if they write the correct answer first, people will read that and then click that and then move on. Well, the, that's exactly what people do. Um, and so it's probably a good thing not to put A as the correct answer choice. But if you're systematically doing that, then that's something that a student can know and can plan for. Um, and so, uh, there's a lot of a lot of training that has to happen uh, for students to not want to do that. But in, in the end, um, being able to pay attention to the order of the choices is, is pretty important. So I've got another example here. Um, this is not one of the ones from the released exam. This is the only one that's not from the released exam in the in the mix here. Um, and I picked this one uh, from another source because it was really kind of powerfully demonstrating the the problem with the discrimination index here. So if you notice the correct answer choice, no one picked. Out of the eight students who got this question at some point, no one picked the correct answer. So the discrimination index on this one was something ridiculous, like negative 70%. Um, that's not a that's not anywhere close to acceptable. So then what's the what's the problem with this question? And so anytime you have a discrimination index, some that something like that, there is a problem with the question. It is not a function of the students not knowing what's going on because we have an example from all of the other statistics that is saying these students this doesn't match with what they should be getting on this test based on all the other questions so this is a fairly subtle distinction here uh, as to why there's notice there's a lot of people picking this answer choice versus and and this one too to a certain extent but this one is the is the highest one of the bunch the right way of if this if we were to turn this answer into the right answer the way that you would make that change would be to change this n right here to an h so that it's helium instead of neon and change this p into an s and then that would be the correct answer choice and so when i first looked at this question I looked at it and said, well, yeah, that's that's the right that's the right answer here, except oh, except for this NE here, that should be H E. In fact, I even missed the P my first time reading through this because once you get comfortable with these, these are called electron configurations, you start to read these things pretty automatically and you don't even necessarily pay attention to all of the individual letters. And so I'm looking at this and saying, oh. Oh, this is a this isn't even an S like it's supposed to be later. It's a P. And see, this is the same thing that my students would be doing here too. And they're reading through and saying X has the electron configuration of uh, 2S22P5, two two even though that's not what it says because that's what they're expecting it to say. And see, now this question has now become not a test of the chemistry knowledge of the student, but instead is a test of the reading ability of the student. And in particular, how closely they are paying attention to every small detail on the question itself. This is essentially what most people would refer to as a trick question. This is not designed to be, this is not a question that is designed to really be carefully testing if a student knows what the electron configuration of, in this case, fluorine is. It's designed to see if they're paying enough attention to what you write out to catch the mistake. 
This is kind of compounded by the fact that instead of listing the actual correct electron configuration over here for a neutral fluorine atom, they're listing it for a fluorine ion, which changes it just very slightly. And so most people will eliminate that one fairly quickly if they're just reading through, uh, reading through fast in a normal sort of way. And so this is the this is the way that you improve your overall test is you make sure that you clean up questions like this because if you can clean up questions like this then that raises the ability of the rest of the test to predict scores and helps you make sure that you are really being that you're really truly measuring a student's ability on the thing that you want to test as opposed to their reading ability or some other topic entirely does everybody see how that that question there is a is a bad example of of how to do things all right well good um so let me show you one more question here that i've got um actually let me take that let me take that back here's a here's the the real way that you make multiple choice good Multiple choice has very little to do with the question and the right answer. Good multiple choice has very much to do with what the wrong answer choices are. So here are two questions, exactly the same question with exactly the same correct answer. And yet one of these questions is asking a very different sort of thing than the other. This first question here is not, even though the question is asking, what year did World War II end? I, Kim, glad you could, glad you could come in. Um, what, even though this question is asking, what year did World War II end? It's not actually testing what year World War II ended. It's testing, do you know what decade it ended in? Because all you have to know to get this right is, you, do you need to know that the that World War II ended in the 40s? And that will be good enough to get you the correct answer. On the other hand, if you look at this question, this is now testing, do you know the actual year that World War II ended in the right date range for what it should be? So when you're looking at making a good multiple choice question it really pays to pay attention to what the other answer choices are and so here's one from the released exam which i really wish that they would clean up along the way um, because you can see here that of the 30 students that took this none of them picked these first two answer choices and in terms of that question, those answer choices really don't make sense. It's one of those situations where you put in a couple extra answer choices to fill out the question rather than making it a better question in the first place. If you have answer choices that are never being chosen by students, then you need to get rid of those because they're not doing you any favors. This is now, instead of a 25% guess chance, this is now really a 50% guess chance. I was actually sitting with a student after school on Friday, and we were talking about this question. Um, and she said, well, yeah, I looked at this question, and these two were definitely wrong. So I just looked at these two from here on out. And then I picked, I picked from, and so she actually happened to pick the wrong one in this case, but then she was just picking from two. But it was just a random guess choice for her at that point. And so if you're increasing the chance that a student can randomly guess the answer correctly, then you are not measuring how much that student knows instead. So it's really important to pay attention to these distractors and make sure from looking at the statistics that all of these things are good. And so this is this is kind of my process. It starts off with a kind of a very broad overview of how the of how the test looks, um, looking at those the overall statistics, and then you start drilling down into each of the multiple choice questions along the way, trying to make sure that they're good. This is one of those things that 
standardized test companies do very well because they field test their questions with actual students and they figure these things out. They see which ones are, are not predicting students well along the way. Um, I have to tell my students every time they take this uh, NC final exam that there are going to be 40 question, 45 questions on the test and only 40 of them will count. The other five are field test questions that people are they're trying out on the students to make sure that they work well. Well, we need to be doing the same sorts of things if we want our test questions to be good too. So at the end of the day, if you'll take a look through the statistics, that'll tell you quite a lot about how to get things to be in a, in a good shape. So um, that's, that's really all that I have. So if you have any, if you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, but I hope y'all, I hope y'all found this useful and, um, and, um, and, and fairly informative. Andy, so the more is always better um, when it comes to sample size. Um, at a certain point, it just becomes a question of at what point do you have, are the numbers stable enough to look at? Um, I would, I, I tend to wait until I have kind of as much data as I'm gonna get to use the numbers rather than trying to worry about kind of in the middle of the, the range. If you can get a class size worth of uh, data though, say 30 students, that's a pretty good sample size. Um, I tend to aggregate all of my stuff over all of my classes for an entire semester so that I can see the, you know, for the 90 students that I have in a semester, what things look like just to get more data. Um, but I mean, you can still get useful information out of smaller chunks. Even this one that we had back here just a second ago with eight students, the discrimination index was so horridly bad, you could obviously tell something was wrong with it just by looking at that. Um, and so when you're looking for, when you have a smaller sample size, an effect is needs to be much larger for it to be something to pay attention to. Um, and so if you're looking at a, at a large multiple choice test, I would suggest at the, at, even if you've got a small sample size, you can look at the worst discrimination indexes that you have and still start doing something with those. So on a, so say on a, like a calculated question or on a uh, short answer question, you'll see, you can see a similar sort of analysis of responses, except for instead of having a list of the possible choices, it'll give you all of the choices and which of the, like if it's short answer, which of the wildcard answers it matched up with um, in each category. And so you'll still get the same sorts of statistics um, on, on this screen here for all of the rest of those. Um, so you can still use them. It's uh, just gonna be, um, it's just gonna kind of look a little bit different along the way. Um, you can still get fairly bad discrimination indexes on short answer questions when you have students who are good students who answer it in a way that you're not expecting and they're graded as, those answers are graded as wrong along the way. That'll still give you a bad discrimination index and you can still look at the, um, look at improving the the possible answer choices there on a short answer question for example and so there are some there are some question types that uh really can't do this sort of thing close is a is a good example of that when you've got different parts where there are um different little subparts it'll calculate a discrimination index for it but it's not going to be able to show you the detailed responses for each sub question along the way um, it just can't get you that level of detail because it's it becomes too complicated too fast. Um, I've actually when I use closed questions, I've got a um, I end up going directly into the database and exporting some things to get the most common wrong answers and just kind of playing with things a little bit to look at them um, because it doesn't really work before. Uh, Joshua, I've got a question which is a bit too long to type in. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I understand that most of what you've talked about tonight comes from um, looking at it from the quiz um, side of things. Is mm -hmm. it possible to go into the question bank and look at individual questions that may have been used in a lot of different quizzes and get the same kind of statistics out? You are asking the question that has been asked a hundred times on the Moodle.org forums. <laughs> no, it is it, it is one of those things that everybody wants to do and nobody's got a good way to make it happen. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be, 
it would be amazing to be able to do that. But um, unfortunately, that gets um, I'm not sure that you would even necessarily be able to calculate a, a good um, discrimination index for these things because it, with it being on multiple different tests, you might not even be able to I, I, I'm not I'm not confident enough in the math on that to even say that that's gonna that's gonna be a clearly solvable problem. Um, certainly, you could get percentages correct um, in a in a meaningful sort of way, but I don't know that a discrimination index would be something that you could calculate. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's really a great to identify bad questions out of context rather than um, having to wait for it to happen. You know, using more numbers in effect. But I suppose you're going to end up with averages of averages or something like that. Sure, and and. Uh, I think from the, from what I've seen, even you know, even on that one, um, even on that one that I had showed you before, that only had eight students that had taken it, it was still painfully obvious when I looked at it um, in terms of the discrimination index that something was wrong with that question. Um, you should, I mean, anytime the the discrimination index is getting anywhere close to zero percent or less than zero, then it's a it's a bad question and a demonstrably bad question in some way. Um, so you've got to start looking at kind of how that how that works along the way. Um, even that, um, to a certain extent, even this this question of um, with the lead oxide here that was um, that was kind of rough there at the beginning. As more students took it later, uh, the numbers actually got better on the discrimination index, and so um, it was it was kind of rough there at the beginning, but um, got better along the way as more students took it. So, Dave, the the formulas question type that you were mentioning is that the um, is that the algebraic type where you can it's not it's not stack it's kind of like stack light. Um, where it's the I think Jean Michael Vidrine or Jean Michel Vidrine was um, was maintaining it for a little while. I've looked at it, but I haven't really had any cause to use it, and so I haven't looked at the statistics to see how that works on that one. Okay. Okay, then uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording now um, and just say, Joshua, thank you so much. That's been really interesting and it's um, encouraged me to go and have a dig around in my databases and see what um, if I can sort out a few questions that um, should be rephrased or um, reformulated. Um, really useful stuff. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Glad y'all could, could be here. Um, Y'all let me know if you have any more questions or um, anything else.